today's seminar will be presented by Kendall Bourne, who is a postgraduate student in the School of Computer Science and Applied Mathematics at the University of the Witwatersrand, where he recently received his master's degree with distinction. Kendall's main area of interest is fluid mechanics and turbulence, but he's also interested in mathematical modeling, bias symmetries, and numerics. He's currently pursuing a PhD in applied mathematics, where he plans to investigate three-dimensional rotational turbulent flow behind wind turbines. And today, Kendall will be presenting a seminar titled Prandtl's Extended Mixing Length Model Applied to the Two-Dimensional Turbulent Classical Far Wake. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Kendall, and please do um, take over. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So I want to start off by saying that Richard Feynman once said that turbulence is the most important unsolved problem of classical physics. And when I mention the word turbulence, I'm sure most of you will picture something a little bit like this. And my slides aren't changing. There you go. Okay, so this is actually a photo of the South African Airbus uh, that was taken by Timo Harsh at Munich Airport. And what I really like about this photo is that the fog in the morning has made both the turbulent wake and the wind tip vortices visible. And my presentation is going to be about the classical wake. So this isn't a classical wake. This is a wake behind a self-propelled body. But the reason why I gave this image is because I think it's an image that everybody can identify with. So we're going to ease into it and we're going to see how it goes. So here's my promise to you that by the end of today's seminar, you'll have hopefully not only a better understanding of turbulence, but also an idea of how we model turbulence and how our research in particular has practical uses in today's society. So just a little bit of background. Um, the fascination of turbulence actually dates back to the early 16th century. So here we can see some examples of classical wakes. So these are wakes behind stationary objects. And these images were drawn by Leonardo da Vinci and I think uh, 15, 13, somewhere around there. So it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, this has been a subject of human interest for hundreds of years. And more so in modern times, we're so quick to jump to more modern methods of dealing with turbulence. So what I mean by this, well, as computer technology has increased, so have our abilities to model turbulence directly. And this is usually with methods such as direct numerical simulation and large eddy simulation. And many industries and researchers use these methods, but there is a downside to using these methods. So the one downside is in general, you need supercomputers and hundreds of hours of access to these supercomputers. So they're very computationally expensive, but it also doesn't give you much insight to the physics of the problem. So it's kind of, you, you're missing out on the fundamentals, I think, by using these more modern techniques. And although large eddy simulations aren't as computationally expensive as direct numerical simulation, it still can't resolve the small scales of the motion, hence large eddies. And I think probably the biggest flaw is that these methods can only be used for low Reynolds numbers. So the Reynolds number is responsible or rather is a measure of how turbulent the flow is. The higher the Reynolds number, the more turbulent the flow can be. The issue with this is most of these direct numerical simulations have um, like huge orders of magnitude as the Reynolds number increases, something like the Reynolds number cubed. So when you're looking at a Reynolds number of 100,000, the grid size that you need to do these simulations is just so massive that 
we can't resolve these type of things numerically. So in order to investigate turbulent flow numerically, we would have to only be able to study low Reynolds numbers. So before I go into Reynolds numbers and these techniques, I want to first speak about turbulent flow. And to do that, I want to first explain how this differs from laminar flow. So consider, for example, some type of channel flow when a pipe. And basically what laminar flow means is that any fluid particle is gonna travel along a nice defined line. They don't necessarily have to be straight, but the point is if we have some particles, so I've got a particle here on the left-hand side, so some type of fluid particle, sometime later, I can predict, or I know pretty much where it's going to be. It's gonna follow this line and move somewhere else. But the point is because it's laminar, we don't expect this particle to jump to some random place like it has here. This is something that's more characteristic of a turbulent flow. And what's I think very interesting about turbulent flow is it's not only very chaotic, but it's unpredictable. And to illustrate a nice example between laminar and turbulent flow, I've put this image that was taken by Dr. Gary Settles. And this is really a brilliant example of a transition between laminar and turbulent flow. So at the base of the candle, you can see the flow is quite nice and smooth. And then as we go towards the top, it wobbles a little bit, and then you can see the chaotic motion. And it's really this chaotic motion that we need to model, and it's quite complicated. And there are some methods that we can use. And one of the methods that we're going to use involves the Navier-Stokes equations. And these are basically the equations of motion for viscous substances. So before we get into the Navier-Stokes, let's talk about the Reynolds stresses. So Osborne Reynolds really described, he was brilliant. He, what he really did is he said that instead of trying to look at this as one system, we'll kind of break it up into two problems. We'll take the velocity and split it into a mean component plus a fluctuation. So we also do this with the pressure, but the general idea is that we separating the flow. So we're separating the fluctuations from some type of mean flow. So we have the mean flow, which I've denoted by a bar above the U, and then a fluctuation, which has the prime on the side. So here's just the Navier-Stokes. So the important term here is the one on the left-hand side. This is gonna cause the nice turbulent stresses that we don't like so much. We have the isotropic stresses, which is from the pressure. And then we also have the viscous stresses. And then we also have the continuity equation, which is basically saying that the amount of fluid that flows into the system must be the same as the amount of fluid that's leaving the system. So it's really a conservation of mass equation. So what we do is we take this Reynolds decomposition and we substitute it into the Navier-Stokes and we get what's called the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation. So this is basically the same as the Navier-Stokes we still have the isotropic stresses, which comes around because of the pressure. We also have the viscous stresses, which I've just highlighted a little bit better for you. But then this is where the fun part about turbulence really comes in. These are the Reynolds stresses, and this is an unknown. We don't really know what it is. It still needs to be determined. And this is the problem of turbulence or the closure problem. It means that we end up with more equations than we have um, more unknowns than equations, sorry. We have more unknowns than equations. So it means that we need to model this unknown Reynolds stress so that we can close the system. So what do we do with that? Well, Boussinesque, came up with the idea to relate these Reynolds stresses using a kinematic eddy viscosity. So it relates the Reynolds stresses or the fluctuations to a viscosity, but it's called the eddy viscosity. 
And what's really interesting about this, so I've just highlighted the mu t, this is basically the part that we're gonna model. So the nice thing to do is to define some type of effective viscosity. And this is just made up of the kinematic viscosity and then a kinematic eddy viscosity. And the only difference between this is that we've divided the viscosity by the density. So after some mathematical voodoo, I promise you, um, for those who it may interest a bit more, you can go look at our paper. But to summarize it, once we've done all these substitutions, we get a nice simplification. But we all know that mathematicians like taking nice little shortcuts, or rather we like abusing some facts of the system. And we notice in the very first equation that we have a V bar. And this isn't great. So why isn't this great? Well, the whole equation is a function of u mostly, but we have this v. So how do we get rid of this? Well, if I put up what is essentially what a classical wake would look like, we notice that on the right-hand side, we can look at the mean velocity of the wake and then also a velocity deficit. And the nice part about this velocity deficit is the further away from the object we go, so further downstream, this velocity deficit gets smaller and smaller. So what happens is when we substitute this velocity deficit into the equation, we get the V bar multiplied by a velocity deficit. And because both of them are small, that term falls away. And we get a very, very nice simplification of the equations that involve the effective viscosity. So now let's look at how we can model these different kinematic eddy viscosities. So the first method, and which is probably the most simple method, is to just set this viscosity to be some constant. So I've just said here that the effective viscosity, which is just the sum of the kinetic viscosity and the kinematic eddy viscosity, is just equal to some constant. Later, through some analysis, we can find out what this constant can be. But the idea behind this model is that throughout all the flow, we assume the eddy viscosity to be constant. And this isn't really re realistic because we know that in certain parts of the flow, we expect the eddies to be smaller. And in other parts of the flow, we expect them to be bigger. So we already know that this isn't a great model, but it can be a pretty good approximation. And we'll see that later. The next model that we're going to look at is Prandtl's mixing length model. And the nice thing about this model is that Prandtl kind of related the fluctuation of fluid particles to some type of length, which I think he took from the kinetic theory of gases. So there's a nice relationship. And basically, the kinematic eddy viscosity is given by this term. So it's some length, which panel called the mixing length, and then it's just multiplied by the, uh, the norm of the, the absolute value of the velocity deficit, the mean velocity deficit. So just to introduce you to the concept of Prandtl's mixing length, what I've got in front of you now is a depiction of the fluid flow. You can see that there's a mean velocity u bar of y. Now, suppose I take some fluid particle and I put it in the flow. So here I've just put it on the border because it's a nice example to show you. If this was laminar flow, the particle would move forward or this lump of fluid would move forward and everything is great. We know where it's going, but this is not laminar flow. We're looking at turbulent flow. So for example, suppose this particle jumps down a little bit because of some fluctuation, V prime. So the particle has now jumped from one layer to another. And I'll call this distance L prime. Well, because we know that momentum has to be conserved, velocity must also be conserved. But as you can see from the diagram, the velocity in this layer is smaller. So to account for this, there needs to be some fluctuation that's greater than zero to make sure that the momentum is conserved. 
And this is the whole idea behind Prandtl's mixing it. The product of these fluctuations must always be less than zero. Similarly, we can just mirror this to the top layer. The same applies. You go from a slower layer to a faster layer, velocity must be conserved, and therefore the fluctuation must be negative. So this is just the, an image, a really nice image that was taken from Schlichting's textbook. And it basically just gives a very nice idea or visual interpretation of how Prandtl's mixing length works. So now we'll go on to the extended Prandtl mixing length. And this was a part of my master's that together with uh, Nick Hale from Stellenbosch, we turned into a very nice paper. I advise that for the mathematicians and the researchers who are interested, please go look at our paper. It explains everything in nice detail. And the only difference between this and Prandtl's mixing length is that we notice if we look at this first term involving L1, if we take the partial derivative of W with respect to Y, we square it and we square root it, we land up with Prandtl's original model. So the nice thing, or rather what we've included, is this term. And how does this help? Well, first of all, the first derivative vanishes at the center line. And we already know that this is not the case in reality. It doesn't vanish. So this term makes up for that. But uh, Dr. Ashley Hutchinson, who actually derived a very nice um, derivation for this model, um, really showed the importance of what the two mixing links are. Because you'll see now there's two mixing links. So the first mixing length is actually just some constant multiple of the standard deviation. And L2 is the kurtosis. Now, before this derivation, I didn't know much about stats. So I had to look up which, what kurtosis is. Um, and kurtosis is essentially just, it describes some type of shape of a probability distribution. And it's quite common to look at turbulent flows of having some statistical probability and some type of distribution. And the really nice thing about this derivation is it really underlines what is L1 and what is L2 physically. And this is important because when we start looking at solutions using these models, we can see how changing L1 and L2 change the answers that we get. So that's quite nice. Um, very nice detailed derivation again in our paper. So let me get on to the data. So uh, Nick Hale extracted this data from Wigansky's um, paper. And Wigansky really showed that regardless of what Aaron, uh, whatever generator is used, the, the velocity, the, the normalized mean velocity profile always remains more or less the same. So this experimental data was taken from wind tunnel experiments. And I think it's quite clear that, I mean, it's a very nice shape. It kind of looks like a probability distribution. Now, the white line connecting all the dots was some heuristic approximation. So some type of best fit line that was determined by Wignansky. And what we will show is how the different models compare with this heuristic fit and the data. So here's my first um, image that we've put all the models on one line and we couldn't see what's happening, which is quite nice. So the equations that resulted, the constant eddy viscosity and Prandtl's mixing length model were both um, solved um, analytically, except for Prandtl's mixing length model, which included the kinematic viscosity that had to be solved numerically. But Prandtl initially neglected the kinematic viscosity. So um, when you neglect the kinematic viscosity, you get an analytic solution. When you don't neglect it, uh, you have to solve it numerically. And this was done previously by Dr. Hutchinson. <clears throat> 
how our method now differs from this, or rather our model differs from this, is that it needed to be solved by a more of a specialist, somebody that has a lot of familiarity with numerics. So um, Professor Hale from Stellenbosch did the numerics for us. And from what I understand, he took these equations and he discretized them using a Hermite pseudospectral method. And then he took the resulting system and he solved it using a Newton iteration and he used the heuristic curve as an initial guess. Um, so absolutely brilliant. He was able to solve these new equations numerically. And I think this is the important part about numerics is that we're finding though, even though the models are simple, you can't always get an analytic solution. So being able to solve these numerically is also obviously of great importance. So if we look at this image, um, what we find is we have the data points, the red dots. 5.1 is the heuristic curve. So I've just taken this, I uh, can't regenerate these. So I've just taken this paper and 5.1 is the heuristic curve. And now we can see how all the models differ. So for the constant eddy viscosity, we see it's not too bad towards the center line, but towards the boundary of the wake, it's not so great. Prandtl's mixing length, again, it undershoots at the beginning, but it's not so bad towards the end. And the extended Prandtl mixing length, what's quite nice about this is we found that L1, which is basically some constant multiple of the standard deviation, didn't affect the profile as much. So we fixed L1 and then we only played around with L2, the kurtosis. So here you can see it's just K2, which is basically just some non-dimensionalized form of L2. And we can see how changing these two values affects the shape of the profile. And we actually found there was a best fit or a nice fit for a certain value of K2. And this was, I think, 0 0.375. And there's some very interesting um, results of using this. So first of all, it's 27% better than both the constant eddy viscosity and Prandtl's mixing length. But I think what's most interesting is it was 22% better than the heuristic curve. So, I mean, that's quite amazing in, in my opinion, that we took a model that was better, ended up being better than a heuristic fit. So this is mostly due to two factors. So the second derivative that was in the model tends to zero at the boundary of the wake. And this actually captures the physical behavior correctly. But because we have those two terms, the L1 and L2 to pray with, we have more freedom in choosing these parameters to better match the data set that we're looking for. So even though it's a normalized data set, L1 and L2 still need to be determined. And the fact that we have two parameters to play with gives us a little bit more freedom than Prandtl's mixing length, where we only have one parameter to play with. So there are some downsides to these methods. And what are these downsides? Well, here we have the stresses, also from Wignansky. And we find that the stresses are different depending on the wake generators. So the one wake generator, I think, was done by an airfoil. The other one was done by a cylinder. But the point is the stresses change depending on the generator. The velocity profile does not, but the stresses do. And this is causing a bit of an issue. So if we look at the different models here, we see that each model behaves differently. And this is definitely a disadvantage of the model that we can't predict the shear stresses as well as we can the velocity. And this means that we should really question the applicability here when we want to investigate the stresses. It probably means that these simple models are not good when exploring stresses 
but they are probably, or actually they are really good when we want to look at the velocity. So I think that basically gives a nice outline and we've got a nice table to show you everything here. First, we have the heuristic curve and there's an error associated with it. We see that the constant eddy viscosity model doesn't really improve on the heuristic curve. It's not so great. Prandtl's mixing length surprisingly is even worse in this particular case. And then we get to the extended Prandtl mixing length, which on average performs much better than the other three, well, the other two models and the heuristic curve. So as I said, the best value was about K2 equal to 0, 0,375. And yeah, I think that basically sums up what we were able to get. Uh, these are all my collaborators, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, Prof. Nick Hale, myself, and Prof. David Mason. Um, we did some really good work. I think that the paper came out really well. The research has shown that it has some applications. So for example, because we can determine the velocity profile quite nicely and where the boundary of these wakes are, if we're looking at something like wind turbines, where the width of the wake can affect other turbines in a wind farm, you might not want to go directly to direct numerical simulation or large eddy simulation if you can use a much easier and much simpler method to also predict these boundaries. Um, and yeah, I think that really sums up everything. Thank you for coming here today. I really appreciate you taking the time and hopefully you learned something new. And if you enjoyed today's talk, uh, please come again and bring a friend. Thank you so much, Kendall, um, for a really um, interactive um, presentation about something that's, um, you know, was really like collaborative as we can see. Um, and we've actually got, I think, um, all your collaborators are actually um, in our audience today, which is lovely okay. to see. Um, yeah. So we've got um, a lot of time now, actually, yeah, um, for, for questions and answers, um, as well as any commentary. Um, so I don't know if you're, um, we've got a, a raised hand already. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, David Rose, would you like to unmute your microphone and, and uh, yeah, go, uh, you can turn on your video as well and go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll keep the video hidden. Uh, Kendall, thanks for an interesting talk. The slide where you have, uh, I think it's Chi N versus F of Chi N. Um, with the different comparative curves. This one. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, am I right in saying that there's a change of concavity and that there's a inflection point at uh, one, chi, uh, chi equals one? Yes. So the way I understand how this data was normalized, it was normalized so that when psi is equal to zero, the velocity is one. And when psi is equal to one, the velocity is a half. Um, so there is like a, a normalization that takes place to meet these two um, conditions. Not no, sure, but I'm saying what, it, what natural phenomenon or property of the equation explains the change of concavity or the inflection point? I'm not too sure about that. It is an interesting question. Um, I don't think we've thought too much about that, but maybe uh, Dr. Hutchinson or Nick has a better explanation as to why that is. My understanding is that's just how the data was normalized. Um, if it interests you, I can look into it and get back to you, though. Um, I don't think there's too much physical significance. Okay. No, it's just that it's, a consist it's consistent across all the curves. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thanks. So if uh, someone else gives an answer, I'd be interested to hear. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Great. Thank you very much, David. Um, I'd like to invite our next participant, uh, audience participant, to please come forward with their question.
Um, I think David left quite a lot of space there for commentary as well. <laughs> if anyone likes to comment. Um, so Kendall, if you'll indulge me, I, had, I do have a, a question about something that you mentioned. Yes. Um, you mentioned that Prandtl neglected the uh, kinematic viscosity. Yes. Um, but you didn't mention why he did this. Ah, okay. So that's actually a very good question. Thank you, Diane, for bringing that up. So I think this is kind of a, there's two answers to this. So first of all, he expected the kinematic viscosity to be very small compared to the eddy viscosity, well, the kinematic eddy viscosity. So on this basis, he neglected it. And Dr. Hutchinson actually showed that there's physical significances for including it. So for example, if you neglect the kinematic viscosity, you get a nice analytic solution. But in order to get that solution, you need to make an additional hypothesis. And this is Prandtl's hypothesis, is in order to determine the mixing length, he made the hypothesis that the mixing length is proportional to the boundary of the wave. Now, the interesting thing is when you don't neglect the kinematic viscosity, you actually can find the form of the mixing length. However, the model can't be solved analytically and it has to be solved numerically. So I think the main reason probably why he neglected it is because he did expect it to be much smaller, which is true, but also you do get a nice analytic solution. So um, yeah, very good question. Thank you for bringing that up. No, thank you. Um, I, I, you. I think you kind of touched on this, but what what was the impact that that have you know that that had on the model? Which I think you kind of touched on in your answer now. So the impact, well, it didn't make the model too complicated, but it means that you don't have to guess the form of the mixing length. You can actually find the form of the mixing length by including this kinematic viscosity. But the downside to this is because you've included the viscosity, the kinematic viscosity, the equation is slightly more complicated and you're not able to find an analytic solution. So you kind of forced to turn to a computer to help you solve it numerically. Okay, so quite an impact then. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kendall. No problem. Um, <laughs> I'm Ledbetter from UCT. Please go ahead. Hi all, uh, and thanks Kendall for a, a great um, introduction to some of the mechanics behind this. I come from a very different background as an experimentalist. My research is in the measurement and characterization of multiphase flow and in particular uh, turbulent um, flows. Um, so I was just wondering what the experimental challenge, what your challenges are from a data point of view. Do you have all the data you need, or what are the what are the things that you desire in terms of the experimental um, information, and, uh, and and just comment on on those things? Ah, that's actually such a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that. So the researchers in general tend to be quite protective about what data they have and what they're willing to share. Um, the nice thing about Wignanski is um, we actually contacted him and he said to us that the data was on like these old tapes and he didn't have them anymore. And he just sent us basically a high resolution of the image that he published. And Nick Hale, I don't know how he did it, but he was actually able to extract the data points from the image, which I think is amazing. And then was able to obviously replot it and reuse it. So I think the biggest challenge for us is really finding data that not only matches what we want to investigate, but is also in, I would say, a nice format. So this particular one was normalized. I think it's quite nice to have normalized data. But I think it would be really interesting to actually collaborate with hopefully people like yourself where we can say, okay, look, we want to, so for example, um, hopefully now for my PhD, I'll be wanting to, ex um, to investigate rotational flow behind a wind turbine. So now where do I find data for information behind wind turbines? Well, it seems to be quite tricky. And there is a very nice team that works in Denmark on a wind farm there. They've got quite a lot of data. 
but it would be nice to collaborate with, I think, some local talent. But yes, the biggest issue is actually just getting a hold of the data um, and data that's in a nice format as well. Um, but yeah, it's very interesting. Um, Dr. Hutchinson actually got a experimental apparatus made for investigating Healy shore cells. Um, I don't think we have the capacity or it's not really within our department to have like a wind tunnel to do experiments, maybe one day in the future, but that's more from our engineering department. They have the wind tunnel. So yeah, having experimental data, I think is very vital because what's the point of investigating these models if we don't have actual data to compare it to? Um, I've seen quite a few papers where they compare models to direct numerical simulation, but how does the direct numerical simulation compare to real world data? I mean, we always want to compare it to something physical in the real world, because that's where we know the applications are going to be at the end of the day. So yes, thank you. That would actually be um, very great. Uh, maybe if I can just follow up on that, Chair. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, my, 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 a lot of my work is on uh, fluid flow um, and on a laboratory scale. Um, so what would your sort of idealized laboratory experiment be? That is a good question. I think me personally, I've been so involved with the theoretical and modeling side, I haven't had much of a chance to really delve into and fully explore the possibilities that come with making and doing experiments and doing all these cool things and looking how the flow behaves. So I think that's something I would have to put a lot of thought into. Um, we must, I think we would, uh, well, at least I would definitely like to follow up. Um, yeah, it would be fantastic. I, I can't answer that question. It's something that I haven't had the opportunity to look into. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tom. All right. Thank you so much, Tom. And thank you, Kendall, um, as well. Uh, we've got, I'm not sure we've got a name, but we've got someone who's unmuted. Um, I've just got Vitz user. I have a feeling I know who it is. Would you like to come forward? Uh, yes, uh, Diane, it's David oh. Mason. Um, in Kendall's first photograph, he mentioned the large vortices around the wings and also the turbulent wake. Uh, could Kendall say a few things about the turbulent wake? Because when we look at this photograph, it's the vortices that one really dominates. Uh, can you say something about the wake, please? Okay, so I think what hopefully, as Prof Mason said, is really evident is the wingtip vortices on both sides of the airplane. So you can see them quite clearly. What you can't see as clearly, but it kind of has the same, it almost looks like the profile, right? This probability distribution. So I actually quite like it. Um, that part is the wake. So it's this, this um, fluid flow, this airflow behind the plane. And the difference is here, the plane is moving through the air, whereas we more interested in looking, well, at least we were interested in looking at a classical wake. So you can kind of think of it as the plane being parked on the runway and then the air blowing over the plane. Um, I think the reason why maybe why in this particular example, the wake isn't as visible is probably as a result of the type of, not the type of fog, but the way that the fog is kind of distributed. But yeah, the, the wake is essentially the, the flow behind the plane. Um, it's not as visible as the wind tip, the wing tip vortices, uh, but the wake is there. I don't know if that answers your question, Prof. Yes, thank you, yes. Great, thank you so much, Prof Mason. Um, uh, it's lovely to have um, such a diverse um, and distinguished audience with us today. Tom has raised his hand again, so would again, you like to go with Tom? <laughs> Thanks, Chair. I thought while we're waiting for some postgrads to uh, to, um, to to have a, I've got a what may be a really 
really ridiculous question. Um, so if anybody's feeling nervous about asking a question, this is the one. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, and related really to your uh, model, um, because uh, I, you, you're adding then this kurtosis term um, with the second order differential. Um, and I was a little bit surprised about, uh, about that. Um, and I, I, I just because I was thinking about the moments of a distribution, the first moment being, and, and you go through the, so the second moment's the mean, the third, is that right? The second's the mean, third's the variance. No, no, the other way around. First is the mean, second is the variance. Um, then third is skewness, which is about shape. And then fourth is kurtosis, which is also about shape. And I was wondering why the choice of kurtosis and maybe not skewness, or, or are there any meanings to the other moments of the distributions? Ah, perfect question. So this actually is very well explained um, in the derivation of this model. So Prandtl wasn't that explicit in explaining how he got to this extended model. And it hasn't been used too much either. I think we managed to find two or three papers where it had been applied to pipe flow. But other than that, nobody's really used this model. So how Prandtl came up with this original model, so his original mixing length, is when this fluid particle jumps down one layer into one layer below, you take a Taylor expansion and you kind of just chop it off at the first term. And that's Prandtl's mixing length. And basically what we did is we took the second order and the kurtosis comes from basically the multiplication and then doing the second order. Um, I didn't want to make this talk too maths heavy. I wanted to hopefully excite a lot of students. And I was kind of hoping that there would be a lot of um, maybe non-academics here. So I wanted to kind of not make it too academic heavy. But uh, yes, yeah, so the kurtosis actually came through when we looked at taking the second order Taylor expansion of the this movement from one layer to a layer below. Um, yeah, they came out just just through the the calculations of um, yeah of the the Taylor expansion. So okay. I don't know why it skipped all the others. Um, I think it's got something to do when we take the mean certain products, when you take the mean, they're zero. Um, other products aren't. Um, the person, if this type of thing interests you, the best person to ask would be the person that derived this, and that would be Dr. Hutchinson. I think she knows this much, much, much better than what I do. Um, it's really impressive, actually, because in Prandtl's paper, he just takes the 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 absolute value, he squares it and square roots it. He expands the term inside the brackets and then magically lands up with his model. And there's a lot of steps missing in between. He doesn't really explain how the second mixing length relates to the first or how it relates to the problem. He literally just says, well, it's in German, but he literally just says L2 is a second mixing length. That's literally like all he does. Not that great explained. Um, it does solve the shortfall of the first derivative being zero on the center line, uh, which we know is not true. So his model did correct for that. But in terms of a physical interpretation, it wasn't provided. And that's what I really like about the kind of the novel contribution that was done in our work is that we have some type of relationship. The first mixing length is some constant multiple of the standard deviation and the second mixing length is the kurtosis. Why there isn't another mixing length or why the second mixing length isn't a measure of the skewness or something, I don't know. Um, what would be interesting, and I've actually thought about this, but I don't know, it would make the problem a bit more complicated, is what happens if we chop the tail expansion at third order or fourth order or fifth order? Um, Maybe because we have more parameters to play around with, we might get better results, but it also means that there's now more unknowns. Um, and maybe, maybe in those, when we look at the products of these tail expansions, maybe the skewness and other things will come up there. I honestly don't know. Um, it would be something to definitely investigate, see what comes up. If you are already using the mean and the variance, so it's sort of 
feels that the ketosis okay but then skewness is missing but then I, I appreciate that as you add more 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 things you end up with more unknowns and that's the nature of this problem anyway so uh, mm. but thanks that's a great answer thanks but i think what makes it a bit more difficult is i didn't have a strong background in statistics either so i did pure maths some physics and applied maths so when it comes to looking at a statistical description of the flow um, Pope, uh, he's got a turbulent flows, I think, by Pope. He does do an explanation of statistical turbulence, but it's not something I'm very familiar with. So there might be ways to relate skewness and all the other things that come with statistics. I see David's got his hand up. He's in stats, um, but it's not something that I'm very familiar with. David, your question. Okay, um, just to start with uh, what you were just talking about, I'm beginning to wonder if the expansion may have something to do with the moments, uh, things like expectation and variance and so on, and ketosis are moments of a distribution. So you may find that uh, that expansion, by virtue of the fact that you, are you seeing variance or standard deviation? I can't remember what you said. Standard deviation. Okay, well, okay, so the square of the standard deviation is variance. So it might well have some relevance to, to moments of the, di uh, the distribution. Um, but then another question I had, I'm sorry, I missed some of your initial parts of your talk, but was this a data-driven study or were there some simulation aspects involved, like a desktop study? Ah, uh, so I have absolutely no experience with simulations or any type of simulation software. So there are quite a few. There's Open Foam, which is a, a like an open source software. Anybody can download it and use it. Um, but a lot of these programs are very programming intensive. Um, so you need to know Python or C++. You also sometimes need to know CAD. Um, and for us, we were more interested in the models, but it's not good enough, especially in more modern times to have just the models. Because a lot of researchers and especially industry is going, okay, cool, you've done this research, but how do we use it? So I think it wasn't really a data driven study, but we definitely wanted to include data so that we could compare it to something in the real world. Um, it has great significant importance to you know, include it in real world um, real world scenarios. So yeah, so yeah, no no desktop um, simulations or anything like that. No, so I'm just uh, suggesting to you and, my, and the other co-authors, uh, maybe there is potential for numerics or stochastic, uh, sorry, of simulation approaches, perhaps. So there are definitely. Um, I did mention, I think, closer towards the beginning that there are other ways to look at turbulent flow. So there is direct numerical simulation. So you take the Navier-Stokes and you basically solve it directly. The issue with this is with larger Reynolds numbers, the grid size or the mesh size, uh, it's not something I'm very familiar with, apparently becomes very large. And to solve it you need like supercomputers, hundreds of hours, and the bigger the Reynolds number gets, the more impossible it becomes to simulate. So to kind of avoid this, they came up with large eddy simulation, um, which kind of just looks at the more larger eddies. Uh, this reduces the orders of magnitude in terms of the Reynolds numbers, it reduces the mesh size, but it kind of, it's not as accurate, but at least you can do it in, I would say, a finite amount of time with probably, hopefully, a desktop computer. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, we just, I think also we just don't have the, the experience or we don't have the skills necessary to run any of these other types of simulations. But we're not interested also in the simulations because the simulation only spits out an output. It doesn't tell you the physical meaning of the output. At least with these models, even though they're very simple and they're algebraic, you do get more complex models. So there's a K, a kappa epsilon and a kappa omega model. So they use um, 
two types of equations instead of one um, to close the system of the Reynolds stresses. The nice thing about the algebraic model, such as Pranel's mixing link, is it gives us a physical interpretation of what's happening in the flow. So for Pranel's mixing length, you can see that L prime or the mixing length itself is some distance that this fluid lump or this uh, fluid parcel can move from one layer to another. It's like a distance. And that's insight that you can't get from a numerical simulation. A numerical simulation, you put in an equation, it gives you an answer. It doesn't tell you the meaning or the physical insights into that answer. So yeah, for us, it's more important to kind of look at the models and hopefully we can learn from the models and design better ones. Uh, there's been some really good work on closure models. I was just thinking the CS part of your school's name might be able to help on the Python and programming side. Uh, that's actually something that I kind of regret not doing. I didn't take computer science. Um, I think that had I taken computer science, I would probably be a bit more familiar with, or maybe a bit more keen on exploring um, programming. Um, I do want to fiddle around with open foam uh, though. I think there's a lot of potential there, especially now when it comes to doing my PhD, I've seen there's some really, really good simulations that you can run in open foam with wind turbines and that sort of thing. But I think for me, at the end of the day, the most important thing would be having some type of physical model so I can see what's happening, but also being able to compare this model with some type of data. So at the end of the day, working with somebody like Tom or pairing up with this team in, I'm pretty, I'm confident it's in Denmark, um, to get my hands on that data so I can say, okay, cool, I've done this research, here's my model, how does it compare to what we expect. Does it predict the flow nicely or not so much? The second question really becomes, um, if you look at our solutions, is that these models tend to work really well for the velocity, but not so much for the stresses. And one of the questions that we kind of put forward was, are these models actually ever going to kind of be accurate for the stresses? Um, I think that would be quite important to look at. Can we design or can we find a model that's not only accurate when determining the velocity in the wake, but also in determining a good or closer fit for the stresses? Can we predict the stresses a bit more accurately? Um, I think that's also one of the really big questions. Yeah, so thanks for that. Uh, if you if you want to contact me about the the moments or about the I've got some I'm also aware of some uh, off the shelf simulation uh, packages that I use myself. Uh, drop me an email if, if you'd like to. Fantastic, thank you, David. Um, I see also a message from Devania from UP. Have you perhaps looked into commercial software like Ansys, Fluent, etc.? Um, the answer to that is no, uh, mostly because I would have absolutely no idea how to use it. Um, but it also becomes a bit tricky. Which software do you choose? I know some of these commercial softwares actually use Prandtl's mixing length as part of the simulation process. So it would might, uh, at least from this research, would suggest that it might be worth telling them, hey, look, uh, maybe you shouldn't use Prandtl's mixing length. Uh, can you try and incorporate this extended model? Um, but yeah, it's not something, as I said, it's not something we've really looked into. Well, I can't speak about um, Dr. Hutchinson, um, but yeah, it's definitely not something that I've looked into. Um, it's probably something I'll look into the future because I think it would be nice to have some type of open foam experimental data and the analytical or numerical solutions. I think to have all three would be quite nice, a mixture of all three. Um, I see Tom says, we do a lot of experimental validation of CFD, some use of open foam. So at the end of the day, I think these simulations are getting really, really good. And again, you can get a lot of 
feedback and information from these simulations. But I think what's really important, especially from our research point of view, is understanding the models behind these software. So it's possible that OpenFOAM maybe uses the K Omega model in its um, programming. I don't know, because I don't know how it's written. Um, but it's definitely something I think we've looked into. I see Ashley's just asked if they have a workshop on open foam. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think somebody was supposed to come and like present a short course on one of these um, type of numerical softwares or CFDs. Um, but I would definitely, if there are workshops on open foam or any type of um, DNS, anything along those lines, I'd definitely be interested in joining that as all. Well.